Uh, right, so um, if uh, you've just come into the room or you're not quite sure of the schedule, um, then the upstairs room, um, the conference room, uh, we have uh, Meg and Manuel. They're going to be talking about embedding learning tools into the OS. Um, but in this room, um, we've got Matthias. He's going to be talking to us about portals, an area where he's got a lot of expertise. So over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm talking about portals. Um, but before I dive into um, that topic, I was going to give a little bit of a background um, for how this came about and uh, talk about um, what problems we're trying to solve with um, portals and sandboxing. And um, so you, you have to think a few years back maybe, um, imagine yourself being an application developer, you want to write a Linux desktop application and there's no flat pack or snap to help you out, so um, you have your application written and um, now you want to get it to your users. Um, you can put a tarball on your website, but nobody's gonna find it, so what are you gonna do? Um, the users get their software from their Linux distribution, so you're gonna have to get your software, your application somehow into distributions, um, so you could start packaging it yourself, uh, make an RPM, make a app, uh, make all these other um, packaging formats. You'll have to struggle with um, all the different version incompatibilities between um, the libraries that are shipped in all those distros, and then again, you can put those uh, packages onto your website and um, nobody's gonna find them. So um, that's an issue and I, I guess that's the situation that we looked at before we started working on Flatpak and um, tried to figure out um, why, is there, why we were struggling to have a uh, striving ecosystem of applications for Linux and um, this fragmentation and this, this problem for application developers of actually getting their software to their users was one of the problems we identified. Of course, there's, there's a myriad other problems and they're all kind of intertwined, um, but, but this is certainly one of them. Um, from the application developer perspective, I guess distributions are like the middleman that are standing between the users and, and themselves. And that makes it kind of hard to have a direct connection. And um, if you wanted to go to charge some money for your software, for your work, um, it's kind of hard to do if you don't even have a a means of directly talking to your users and getting updates quickly to them or giving them information um, because you have no, no idea who they are. They get an application that's in some distribution package uh, delivered on a schedule that you have no influence over. So that's, it's a very problematic situation and I guess one of the, the things we try to um, set out to do with Flatpak is to give application developers a way to make their software directly available to users and also build it in a way that has a chance of running almost everywhere, or at least on a wide range of different um, distributions without having to rebuild it and struggling with version differences. Um, and switching perspectives a little bit from a user perspective, um, distributions of course serve an important role. They, they are the trusted source of your software. So you go to a distribution, you download um, applications and you can have some level of trust that somebody looked at the code and um, that you don't get um, bad software on your system that spies on you and, and steals your secrets. At least that's the theory. How well that works in practice, um, uh, we can have a discussion about that. Um, but certainly that's the expectations that user has, users have when they use a Linux distribution. They get vetted software from that source. And if we set out to bypass that middleman and have users go directly to GitHub or some other modern application store and download software from there. Um, we have to have maybe some replacement for this trust. Even though in practice we all have downloaded RPMs from the internet and just installed them and hoped for the best and hopefully we felt bad about it but that's what you do. And um, so the replacement that we, that we came up for that other people have come up for with before is um, sandboxing. So if we want to encourage users to just download software from the internet, we have to give them a way to run that software in an isolated way that um, isolates the app from your, from your host system so that the application that you run cannot sneakily use your webcam to take pictures of you while you're doing that. And also isolate um, the application from your data so it cannot sniff through the files that you have in your downloads folder, things like that. And finally, also, we want the applications to be isolated from each other, so um, you can 
try one application out and then another one and, and they won't see what, what you have used, uh, done with them. Um, so that's basically the, the high level theory of uh, what sandboxing is about and looking uh, a little more in detail at flat pack sandboxing. This is um, how the sandbox looks from the inside for an application. Um, the application gets access to a little bit of writable storage in your home directory where it can save files and its data, gets a display connection, and um, some of the saved parts of the file system are exposed inside the sandbox, for instance the themes and fonts and time zone data, things of that nature, and uh, also runtimes and the application binaries themselves are also mounted inside the sandbox in a read-only way. Um, so this is basically the, the basic sandbox setup that Flatpak provides to every application, no questions asked. That's um, what you get if you don't um, need anything else. But some applications need more things, for instance, the network, very common that you want to interact with the outside world from, from your sandbox. So that's an optional thing that um, applications can, can ask for. And then there's also various session bus services that desktop applications typically want to use. And um, again, that is optional, so they have to configure their sandbox um, to, to allow the right services inside. That, that's something I should say. Uh, all of this um, sandbox setup is static. It's basically a build time configuration. When you write your Flatpak manifest to build your application, you have to write down which services you need access to and whether you need network or not, and all these things are fixed at build time. And um, the user can override these settings um, if they want to, but typically that should not be necessary and the application should ask for the things that it needs and should work fine without further tweaking. And then we get to the parts where we actually want to enforce isolation, uh, isolation and um, take things away from the application. So typically the application does not get access to the rest of your home directory. I mentioned there's a small writable storage area, but everything else is off limits as are other parts of the file system, like slash Etsy, except for the, the few select pieces that I mentioned earlier, like time zone information. And um, also random devices, like your webcam, or the D-Bus system bus, all of those are um, normally not available inside the sandbox, because that's what we want. We want to isolate the application and uh, restrict what they can do. But of course, when we set out to do flat pack, we started from scratch, there were no applications at all. So to build an ecosystem, you have to have some critical mass. So we figured that we need to make it easy for existing applications to work in this environment. So there's a lot of flexibility built into uh, the Flatpak sandbox setup code and applications can actually um, ask for more if they need to. And that's what we call sandbox holes, which is what happens when an application is not written with a sandbox set up in mind, so it might randomly need access to a few files in your home directory and then uh, the Flatpak sandbox setup is flexible enough to let you poke some of these holes. Typically, uh, holes might be poked for the home directory or for full session bus access or for access to particular devices that you may want to use. Um, these are, as I said, it's like a transitional measure. We wanted to make it easy to get existing applications to work without uh, regressions. But ideally, we still want um, the sandbox to provide meaningful isolation and, and actually uh, lock things down. So we, w I, we want to get to a place where there's as few sandbox holes as possible, ideally none. And um, <coughs> the question is, how do we get there? One thing we've done in the last year since um, Flatpak 1.0 is to at least make it visible what access an application asks for. Here's an example um, showing in GNOME software that we present the sandbox holes that an application has configured in this um, pop over there. And um, we try to kind of uh, visualize that some of them are maybe more questionable than others. And we also have this kind of information in the control center now. So uh, we also show, you can see the applications that you already have installed 
and we show um, how sandbox they are and how many holes their sandboxes have. have. But uh, I guess this only gets us so far. Ideally, we still want to do without the statically configured sandbox holes in the first place. Uh, the question is, how do we get there? And I guess the answer is with portals. And with that, I'll um, switch to talking about portals now. And I should probably start by um, explaining a little bit what portals are. Um, on a very high level, portals are an API or a way to give applications access to system resources and user data under the control of the user. And they are dynamic. So as opposed to the statically configured sandbox holes that you set up at build time, the application that uses portals makes requests when it's running for certain data or resources that it needs. And then the user can grant those requests or deny them. So there's an expectation of user interaction built into this. And ideally we hope this will eliminate the, the need for sandbox holes in the long term. And for pragmatic reasons, because that's what we have on the desktop, they are implemented as Dbus APIs, Dbus interfaces, in a, in a certain namespace here, org.freedesktop.portal. And when I talked about sandboxing earlier, I mentioned that um, the session bus access is filtered. So in general, applications have to ask for being allowed to talk to certain services on the session bus. But um, this namespace here is exempt from that. So we always grant applications the right to make requests to portals because that's what we want them to do. And here are some examples of typical requests that we would want to have or that we actually have portals for. Things like opening a file or saving a file, printing a document or opening a document in another application, showing notifications, um, taking a screenshot, these sorts of things um, are, are existing portals that we have. There's some more here. Um, and I guess if you look at these, they are kind of on the level of um, things we usually have dialogues for in, in the desktop, like this. Opening a file, there's a GTK dialogue for that. Or taking a screenshot, there's a, a GNOME dialogue for that. And so one slogan you could have for portals is these are out of process dialogues. Um, and that's, that's how they are often implemented. Right, I wanted to show an example of a portal in action and I'll try to do that as a live demo. Let's see if this works. Oh, a bit big. I hope this is not too big. Um, So this is a uh, demo application uh, for demonstrating portals essentially and it's written in Qt. And now the application has called into the screenshot portal requesting to given, be given a screenshot and um, the system, and in this case the XCD desktop portal service has reacted by showing a dialogue which looks very familiar to you probably because I just copied this UI from GNOME screenshot, more or less wholesale. And yeah, I can hopefully take a screenshot here. And um, the dialogue comes back and shows me the screenshot I've taken. And I should stress that this is all, this dialogue is, is running on the host side, so it's not inside the application. And I as, I, as a user, have the chance to review the screenshot I've taken now before I make it available to the application. And I cannot also decide that this is not what I wanted. And take a different screenshot. Hopefully. I'll, I'll redo this quickly. That's the fun of live demos. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to confuse yourself, right? 
Anyway, uh, I'll now click the share button here. Uh, I can manage. And now you can see the application acknowledges that it actually received the screenshot now and has saved it as a file somewhere. So, uh, yeah. Back on track. Um, so this was the live demo part, minor accidents included. Um, my, the title of my talk was uh, Portals, Principles and Practice, so I should probably present some principles here. And uh, these are basically the design guidelines that we try to follow while um, implementing portals, like the one you just saw. So the first principle is that we always want to have a user interaction in, involved here because we really want the user to control what the application gets to access or not. We try not to be dogmatic about that. If, if you think back to the list of examples I had earlier, many of them I said are kind of like dialogues, and it makes a lot of sense to present a dialogue for the user interaction for those, like opening a file or taking a screenshot. Those are examples where that works well. But there were some others that are more behind the scenes, like getting um, network status information, for instance. You wouldn't expect the a dialogue for that. So we're not dogmatic about enforcing a dialogue for everything, but we, that's just a, a guiding principle, I guess, for what is a good candidate for a portal request, something that you would typically want to have user interaction for. And um, yeah, we want the um, dialogues to be clear, and by that I mean that we always want to clearly identify what resource the application asks for and which application is asking for it. And I can try to maybe go back here, and you can see if you read the text in the dialogue, we actually, uh, the dialogue tells you which application made the request here. So that information is available for sandbox application. Flatback has a way to reliably identify which application made the request, and we can actually present this information to the user and be relatively certain that that's, that's the uh, truth. Right, um, third principle here is don't be annoying. And by that I mean um, we'll try to, we want to try to avoid annoying yes, no, click through dialogues. This is, on some level, this is all about permissions, so there's a certain danger that you just ask a yes, no question. Do you want to allow the application to do blah, blah, blah? And I mean, those typically get in the way, and do you get annoyed and just click through them without thinking about it? And what we want to do instead is um, try to make this more constructive and have the user actually carry out the task in question. As you could see with the screenshot, the dialogue actually made me take the screenshot and then review it and give it to the application, as opposed to just answer a yes, no question. Similar for opening a file, we'll actually present a file chooser where the user can navigate through the file system and pick the file, or if he chooses that he does not want to do that, he can cancel the dialogue, which, um, yeah, don't be annoying is the, the short slogan for that. And yeah, finally, uh, we want to be consistent, and um, it, it should be easy to see that this is a portal dialogue and not part of the application. Um, and I'm not sure how well we're doing on that in, in all regards. Like this was just a regular GTK dialogue that the application should have could have presented itself. So we are not maybe doing as well on that principle than on some of the others. And we also have a bit of a mix, mishmash currently between. GTK dialogues and GNOME shell dialogues, like some of the portals just directly call out to GNOME shell and then you'll get a shell style dialogue, which on, on one hand is maybe better for this kind of uh, principle because they make it very clear that this is a shell dialogue and not an application dialogue, um, as opposed to the GTK dialogues where the application could just present something that looks very similar. But um, we're trying. So much for principles. Um, switching to practical considerations. Um, so, as I said, one of the principles is that we want to have, we want to ask the user a question. It should be interactive, and um, that has some consequences for the way the Dbus APIs are designed. Because if I bring up this dialogue, there's no guarantee that the user will react right away. The dialogue could be up for 
could be buried behind other windows and be up for a while and we don't want a method debus method call to time out while while this dialog is up. So um, the, the portal APIs are done with a request object and a response signal to avoid having a sim sim simple um, method call. And that also gives us the chance to let the application cancel a request. I mean, it could be the dialog, as I said, was buried behind other windows and by the time the user gets to it, it's no longer relevant. So might as well have the application cancel the request when it's no longer needed. And that, that's enabled by having this uh, request object that we can actually make uh, a cancel call on. <coughs> Unfortunately, um, this makes the portal dbus APIs a little more annoying to use than your average dbus API, maybe. Um, but that's a price we were willing to pay for this. Next practical consideration is um, front end, back end separation. So, um, these are basically, the portal APIs are trust boundaries, so we, we have untrusted applications that make calls to this, and um, we want to do a good job of um, actually validating all the arguments and make sure that we handle things properly so the application cannot easily crash the portal service, for instance. And for that reason, um, that's one of the reasons that we have a split into a front end and back end for the portals. The front end handles all the argument parsing and validation, and handles checking permissions, and then it calls out to a backend that will actually uh, carry out the request. And there's different backends um, that use the platform services that we have. There's one backend for using GNOME services, and there's another one that's using um, KDE session services for implementing all the different portal requests. That's why, for example, the the QT um, portal demo that I ran earlier was just bringing up a GTK dialog. That's because the demo application talks to the portal front end, which then calls to the um, portal back end that is using the GNOME session services to, to do its business. Right. The last uh, practical consideration I want to uh, bring up here is um, making portals convenient to use. Uh, I already said the Dbus APIs are not perfect for that because they uh, are not as straightforward as a method call. But thankfully, um, we have a lot of existing library APIs that are already available and that applications are using, say GTK for having the file chooser, or uh, Geo, GeoClue for uh, getting the location. And in many cases, we can transparently make these library APIs use the portals when they recognize that we are inside a sandbox. And that's, I guess, the ideal scenario because then the application doesn't have to do anything. It just continues using whatever library it was using and things just magically work. And um, yeah, looking at some of the examples that I listed earlier, um, the file, file chooser, um, can handle open a file and save a file. Um, at least um, if you're using the GTK file chooser native interface. Um, yeah, maybe I'll talk a little bit about that here. Um, GTK file chooser is a complex API with lots of different interfaces and uh, there's GTK file chooser dialog, GTK file chooser button. There's a more generic GTK file chooser interface and um, the problem with the GTK file chooser dialog API is that it allows you to embed, it allows applications to embed widgets directly in the dialog. It's an example for an extensible dialog, I guess. And uh, that's something that's not easy to reproduce if you're doing the dialog out of process. So a few years ago, we added a file chooser native interface, which is specifically designed to enable out of process um, file choosers. And before we used it for portals, we already used it for uh, native file choosers on Windows. And uh, there's a similar case here for the print dialog, if you want to print a document. Um, you may just use GTK um, print, Unix print dialog, which is the, the dialog that we use for this on, on Linux. But um, that's the non-portable non version, and again, it's an extensible dialog where um, things can be directly embedded in the dialog. 
And we have a higher level API for this called TTK print operation, which kind of abstracts it all away because we needed that on Windows again. When we initially added printing to GTK, it turned out that um, you can't easily reuse the Windows print dialog, so we had to invent GTK print operation, and uh, now we can reuse that for uh, retrofitting portals underneath the GTK print API. So if you're using the high-level print operation API already, then you magically um, support the, the print portal now. And uh, there's a few more uh, APIs here that are listed. For opening a UI, we have a GTK show UI, which I guess is commonly used for that purpose, and which, um, which we could just put the portal underneath. And for notifications, there's a G application API that is ready made for that. If you go down the list further here, um, it gets a little thinner. There's some things that we just don't have a library API for. And in those cases, um, if you need the portal, you have to probably use the Dbus API for now, or alternatively, uh, start writing a library. And yeah, going down this list, it's, um, as you see, there's still a few that we have covered and some that we don't. Um, the last one here, accessing settings, is an interesting one. I listed G settings there. Um, but we really only need a portal for this due to how G settings is implemented and is using, it is using dconf underneath, which is a very centralized system that stores all the application settings in a single place, in a single database for the whole desktop. And um, that's not very well aligned with the idea of having applications isolated from each other and have their own little sandbox where they do what they want and don't interfere with each other. Um, dconf is kind of coming from the opposite direction of wanting things centralized and managed and controlled. Um, it's friendly for like enterprise setups where you want to like pre-configure the application settings from some other place. Um, but in this case, it's not a great fit. Um, and the world would be much easier if every application would just store its own settings in a key file and be done with it. Then we wouldn't have to do anything. And in fact, that's exactly what we ended up doing for solving the um, the settings problem here. We made um, G settings uh, use its key file backend when it recognizes that it's in a sandbox. So effectively, each application just writes its own key file. And um, that makes a portal basically unnecessary, except for the one case, um, we're also using G settings for toolkit level settings that we, that really need to be shared across the whole desktop, like um, say, your font or um, DPI settings, um, font rendering settings, things of that nature, or the theme. And GTK has a GTK settings API for that. And we just made a small read-only um, Dbus API to replace that. And that's the settings portal that we have. Right, um, now I was going to switch and talk a little bit about uh, disadvantages and advantages of portals or this, this whole idea. And I'll start with the disadvantages. Um, some UI patterns just um, don't work very well with this um, portal setup. And that's mainly cases where um, we embed system information in the main UI of the application. As, as I said earlier, one slogan for portals could be out of process dialog, so we really want to keep the information inside the dialog until we are ready to hand it over to the application because the user has given the go ahead. And there's some UI patterns that <clears throat> we have in our applications where um, we kind of break that. One example would be recent files, um, where you have like a context, uh, have a menu that lists a lot of files that have been accessed by other applications. Um, actually, I think I have a screenshot of that. Let me show that quickly. So this is um, an example of recent files. And ideally, we don't want to give the application access to this full list, but only to the files that it is supposed to open itself. And that's actually the, the smaller list that the application could just show without problems. Like, it, it obviously has access to the files it has opened itself. But um, sometimes these lists include other, other files that say you have opened uh, an image um, 
with Inkscape, and then you later want to retouch it with the GIMP, then you might want to see it here, but that's the problematic case. Um, in a similar, similar problem case is um, open with context menus. In Nautilus, we have this, we used to have this context menu which has a list of applications that you can open the file with. And that's again information about the system that we may not want to give to an untrusted uh, sandbox application. So we'll have to do that somewhat differently then. And I already talked a little bit about um, the problems with extensible dialogues like um, the file chooser or the print dialog. And I think I have a, yeah, I have a screenshot of that as well. This is an example of, um, I think this is gedit. And it adds this little um, encoding chooser at the bottom of the file chooser. That's actually a widget that uh, gedit adds to the dialog. And um, yeah, that's kind of hard to do if you're out of process. But what we had, did for the file chooser portal is we added a little bit of extensibility to the portal API as well. So uh, this is actually doable with the portal now, just um, to make it easier for applications. Right, um, but obviously there's also advantages of using portals. The, the most prominent one, the obvious one, is that it enables our sandboxing story. That's why we started this in the first place. And it also, um, taking as a whole, I think it provides a, almost like a portability layer. Like you get um, high level APIs that applications can use that will work the same in KDE and GNOME. And if there, if there would be other portal backend implementations, they could work elsewhere as well. So it's a bit of a portability story, I guess you could say. And um, finally, native dialogues is something that um, have been requested for a long time from GTK. That's why we did the file chooser native um, Windows implementation originally. And this basically gives us native dialogues now across Linux desktops as well. Right. Um, so um, we are not quite there yet in terms of actually having our, our sandbox story fully worked out. We have portals and we have sandboxes with lots of holes. If you, I haven't actually done statistics, but if you look through applications that are currently on, on FlatHub, I, I would assume that most of them have uh, a bunch of sandbox holes that would be fairly easy to plug if you wanted to, if you put some effort into it. And um, I guess that uh, would be a nice outcome if some people feel encouraged to actually take a look at that and see what we can do to improve the story. So what can you do? One thing, uh, the easiest thing is, of course, to use the existing portals where they, where they fit well. And the easiest way to do that is to use the portalized library APIs, I would say. Um, and in some cases, that, that is as simple as switching from using GTK file chooser dialog to using GTK file chooser native, or from using the, the print dialog directly to using GTK print operation. So that's, um, that's fairly easy to do and would improve our story. And there's, there's some more cases like this um, for launching applications, for instance, um, if you're not using G desktop app info directly, but use G app info launch default, then that's again something that we, uh, that glib transparently will translate into portal calls for you. And so that is something that you should look at doing. Yeah, some more things you can do is um, if you are using G settings in your application, which most likely you are, uh, you can remove the decon hole from your sandbox setup um, because we now do have support for um, the key file backend in, in glib. So if you do that, things will just magically keep working. And we also try to um, get the migration story working transparently. So if you have an existing application that is currently using deconf and you remove the sandbox, the sandbox hole for deconf, then two things should happen. Um, inside the sandbox, when the user updates the application and runs it again, glib will now prefer the key file backend and so will we'll, uh, no longer use deconf and thus will not need to deconf hole anymore. And on the, on the host side, Flatpak will recognize um, that the application was using deconf and is no longer doing that and it will do a one-time conversion. It will read the existing 
settings out of the deconf database and store them in the key file that the application expects to read. Uh, so if things align well, that should be fairly transparent. We had some problems with that initially, but I hope it's all worked out now. Right, um, what else can you do? You can suggest what portals would help your application. That would be a very useful thing to know. Um, and finally, of course, you can maybe chime in and, and try to write one yourself. Uh, I think we are more than happy to help with that. And we have already gotten some contributions uh, um, for portals, and uh, that's very appreciated. Uh, here are some ideas for portals that might be useful. Some of them have been requested before. Some of them have been discussed here this morning, like the uh, secret storage, for instance. And um, some others, um, I think we, we may have some patches for, for some of these already. But there's certainly um, a lot of things that could be done and um, that are actually not that hard to do. So uh, I would encourage you, if you feel inclined, to take a look at maybe writing a portal for setting a background image. That could be a very uh, self-contained to, thing to do, and um, ideally then use it in your application. Um, yeah, some other of these, these examples, the um, update yourself and install software. I do believe we have patches for that. We just need to merge them. And um, some of them are more involved, like the sharing portal is something that we have discussed from the early days of Flatpak, and um, we never really got around to writing it. Well, that's a big task. But don't let that discourage you. And uh, if you want to get involved, find out more, these are the places to go. And with that, I'm open for questions. Um, hi, what is the technical barrier to having a directory portal as opposed to just a file portal? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I think it involves some links on some level and maybe Alex can say more about that. So fundamentally you would give like random access to a subdirectory and that is not a way you can contain something, right? You, you can escape it using symlinks or a weird, there might be weird mount stuff. And, and, and additionally, you would have to do it by like having a fusive file system that, it, it, so you duplicate the mount point somewhere else using some other file system and accessing it. From, I mean, it just opens up so many piles of t cans, basically, it's just... I mean, it, it's, not, it's not that it isn't doable to expose a directory using Fusey. It's just that there's so many ways it could go wrong. We have discussed, though, um, while not solving the full open directory use case, we have discussed allowing applications to open or save multiple files in one request, which would probably cover a bunch of use cases already. For instance, the evolution save all attachments use case can be handled that way without having first to solve the, these hard cans of worms. Um, so by always putting the user in control of what um, resources the application has access to, doesn't that increase the possibility of the user making mistakes? For example, the application knows that once a specific camera or device and the user gets listed a whole bunch of devices on the system and has the option to access the wrong one. Yeah, uh, there's certainly some danger there and there's um, part of like making portals work well is to like have them at the right level to ask the user questions that are meaningful. You don't want to like ask minutiae details that, that have no meaning to them but choosing the right file to open if you like try to edit a file and in LibreOffice, for instance, that's something that a user will pay attention and will try to do the right thing. And choosing the right webcam to use for like uh, your video conference might also be something where you can easily um, uh, pay attention because uh, it's about streaming your data out to the world. So it, it depends on asking the right questions, I believe. But yeah, there's I mean there's a certain danger of, of 
just asking too many questions and be, being annoying, as I said, we don't want that. So we don't want this to be a constant stream of dialogues where you have to like choose this, choose that, and like mm -hmm. it has to be done with the right level of, of detail. I, I wanted to mention that the, there's at least one of the, uh, the portals that's, uh, that's been listed as needing to be written that I'm working on, the USB one. So okay. when that happens, that should be, uh, yeah, that should be nice. Uh, I also wanted to mention that not every permission needs to be a portal. Uh, we also use Wayland. Wayland is extensible. And uh, Carlos Gamachos started working on uh, an API to be able to share uh, input devices, in particular uh, joysticks, so that joystick uh, permi access permissions would go along with the, uh, the application focus. What that means is that uh, any application that runs on top of GNOME Shell and a Wayland session would get uh, implicit access to the input devices on the machine. So you, you don't actually need to pull calls to, uh, to get access to, to uh, an actual physical device node. And that means that uh, we should be able to get, uh, to get joystick support for free for all the applications, whether they use glib or SDL or anything else. Yeah, I think that's a very fair comment to make. We should, I mean, it's not, it's not about making everything a portal. It's just about um, having a pattern that works for the cases where we need it. And as you say, the display protocol already covers a bunch of things. Another example is the clipboard, which usually goes through the display protocol, whether it's X or Wayland. So we don't need a portal for the clipboard. So you said something along the lines of trying to distinguish, visually distinguish the portals from the application. I was wondering what the reasoning there was. What's the value of, well, say, having yet another visual appearance? Um, it's, it's about preventing the application from spoofing. I mean, you want to tell the user, now you're talking to the system, whereas now you're talking to the application, I think. Like if, you, if the application is really untrusted, you kind of want to know and am I entering my, the data that I'm just entering into something that I trust or something that I do not trust? It's about making this trust boundary kind of sensible for the user, apparent to the user. But yeah, I mean. But if you're entering a password into something, then you have to know that it's actually not the app just throwing up a password dialog. Any more questions? Or? Unless we get to lunch early. No, we don't. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, have you thought about ways of revoking granted permissions? Like, oh, you know, okay, parts so are way in, but you may like revoke the, the right to the joystick, for example, or the webcam? Or All right, I, I did not actually talk a lot about permissions. Uh, I, I briefly mentioned that the front end, back end split that we have in the portal implementation is so that the front end can handle permissions and uh, argument checking. What I did not mention there is that uh, Flatpak brings its own permission store, which is basically the one place where all the portal store, whatever permissions um, they record. Like if you uh, use the portal to get access to the webcam, I, I guess we don't want to ask that question every single time because we don't want to be annoying, so we'll, we'll store that information in the permission store that Flatpak has. And the application panel that I showed a screenshot of in the control center is actually the place where you can go to, to see those permissions as well and to revoke them. And the Flatpak command line also has uh, some commands for listing the contents of the permission store and for removing, revoking permissions there.
yeah, thanks again, everybody, and um, have a good lunch.